<laughs> no, no, no. We're not going to wait another hour. I don't know what happened there, why it's counting down for another hour of time. We're going to get started. Hi, good evening, y'all. <laughs> Well, good. Well, hopefully that's our glitch for this mission. I'm Jeff. It's nice to see you again tonight. We're going to dive right into it. I'm drinking a Hazy Hero from our local brewery, Revolution Brewing, here in Illinois. If you are drinking something fun and tasty, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, water is always a good choice. I know beer and drinking is not everybody's thing. No pressure if it's not. Oh, delightful. That kind of threw me for a loop there. I was like, oh, I got this for 59 minutes. Won't that be nice? And like relax, stretch out, get things working a little bit better. But no, we're just gonna, we're just gonna dive right into it. Hi, good to see some of you again. Thomas, hi. <laughs> Hello as always. Yeah, a little bit wonky there, Chris. Hello, good to see you. Um, yeah, we're gonna work on winch stuff tonight. Um, so we kind of, I kind of prefaced this project last week with like a, um, what I think the next sort of big mechanical project is gonna be. And I think it's gonna be, oh, well, it is gonna be a, the goal is an uh, electronic winch uh, that is the scale uh, that fits the miniature moving light project. Now, as you might be able to tell, I have not done any work on making the camera angle for the <laughs> the highfalutinly named micro stage any better. In fact, it's quite dark over here because I've had to unplug its power supply for a little bit. But the whole the the goal is now to come up with a small three D printable design for an electronic winch that could be used to raise and lower some you know scale line sets or truss or something like that. Cause that'd be fun, right? Um, so yeah, that's the goal. Lots of progress already this week. So let me share with you what I have already done, um, what I figured out, and what I think we're gonna be working on tonight. Um, which is some more three design, some mechanical things to work out, and some one very obvious problem to solve with the design as it currently exists, which you will see very shortly. So let me talk to you about that design. Um, let me talk you through my phases of. Uh, well, no, no, no. I, was say, I could talk to the phases of the development, but this is the functional model, which I think will be the most indicative of how I wanted the, uh, the, <laughs> the mechanism to actually work. Um, so let me share it with y'all, like, what it actually is and how it works, and then I can tell you about all the ways that, other things that I tried that, that didn't work super well. Um, so this obviously is not currently a motorized winch, right? It has a big old handle on top of it. Um, I think, I think this orientation is going to be kind of best to see that sort of 90 degrees to the workbench here. Um, we have in the middle, right, our central drum around which our lifting line is currently wrapped. Now, this is some really, really cheap polyester twine that I picked up from Home Depot. I mean, it's like a $3 for 100 yards or something, and it's it's really awful. <laughs> it's already falling apart. Um, but I got it knowing it might be awful, and also means that, like, when I screw up and I, like, you know, can't untie it from the thing. I have no compunctions about just snipping it off this drum because it didn't cost me anything. <laughs> um, in fact, I'm going to take a hot second and just snip, snip some of this like frayed excess off because it's going to make me a little bit nuts here. Let's snip that there. Okay. So, right, this would be the line that goes to our load. And this could either be in a motor up or a motor down configuration, right? So this, this winch mechanism, when it's ultimately compactified and motor powered, it could be, you know, hanging, could be hanging on a, maybe a truss structure uh, with the line strung down, uh, or maybe the, the, the winch itself lives in the lower structure, which is a hook and a tie point up to an upper structure. Either way, it won't really make a difference. <laughs> Chris, what's the working load limit on this? Ah, uh, I have no idea. I don't think there is one. I think it's specifically like, it's not even like monofilament line where you'll get like 50 pound test or 100 pound test. I think it's literally just was like white twine, white polyethylene twine. So you get what you pay for, <laughs> it turns out. So that attaches to this central drum here. Actually, as I'm looking at this, I'm gonna just double check my video settings because things seem a little bit dark to me. Um, Cause I think we can brighten things up a little bit there. Yeah, there we go. That's a little bit better. Um, so as this drum turns, right, that the twine will be wound onto the drum. Um, this design is very much inspired by like chain lift mechanisms, whether you think of like a, either a manual chain hoist or a motorized chain hoist. Um, so the, the winding, it turns out, is quite simple. So, right, the the goal is for this to be wound onto the drum and stay there, and then this can either support itself or can be supporting a load or what have you. Um, the uh, method of making a winch that will go up and not come down is also relatively simple using a ratchet wheel. And that's what this mechanism down here is. Let me get this out of the way. You'll hear it. I think you can probably hear it click as I spin it around there. Um, 
So this is this mechanism took me a few tries to get right, and I'll show you the, I'll show you the failed tries in a second here. Um, but it's all it's all a three D printed mechanism. We have this this ratchet wheel here, which lives uh, on the same uh, axis as the barrel that the twine is wrapping around itself. It's not directly connected. You can see there's other hardware here, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But essentially, right, we've got this ratchet wheel with these sort of angled teeth. We have our ratcheting pawl, right, our arm that clicks in the ratchet teeth. We have a spring to hold it tight against the ratchet, right, because if this were to fall away, then this barrel could spin freely, and we don't want that. And then we have a couple pieces of hardware here to just position that pawl in the right place. So this, here, I can take this apart a little bit. If I take the pawl out of the way, um, you can see I have this 3D printed shaft coupler. So this is actually a square, <laughs> a square pegged coupler. I originally had a, a screw thread here that didn't work super well. So I just went to a square thread. It's got a hole in the top. I don't know if you can see just, just down there for a cotter pin, but the tolerancing is so tight that I, I just didn't bother to install it on this one. And this one has a little shoulder so it inserts to the right depth and then a circular sort of bearing surface for this pole to sit upon. And it's a, it's a pretty tight friction fit. Um, so I had to do a little sanding. You can tell it's a little bit scuffed up there, but you know, this part doesn't have to move very far anyway. And there's a lot of force asking it to move whenever it does. So I'm not super worried about friction there. That, in that point, I'm not super worried about friction. He said, presaging what was to come later. Um, and then I have a 3D printed screw, uh, you know, bolt and screw surface here just to keep that pole captive. And because I was lazy and didn't really chamfer the edges of my bolt as I was designing it, getting it started again is a, is a, a bummer, I think is the technical term. Um, so if it doesn't go back in, I'm not going to sweat it too hard. It's also possible I should double check. Yeah, no, I think this is right. So one, one of the things you'll see when, I, when we talk about like things that didn't go well um, was I actually designed, because of the way this mechanism works, and we'll get to that in a second, mask it. Um, the right in, in some sense right we could have this this ratchet go in either direction right now we have sort of the ratchet it turns clockwise but not counterclockwise um and that means that like for example in this case our up direction is clockwise it winds tight it doesn't wind back down and you can sort of think like well you know clockwise counterclockwise doesn't really matter we could pick either of them arbitrarily it would sort of ratchet in one direction and not in the other um and so I designed it to actually to ratchet counterclockwise to start with, and then discovered that there was an issue with that. And the issue has to do with how this winch design handles going in the down direction, right? How are we going to get this thing, which has once gone up to come down? Um, and one way, right, would be just to release the pawl, right? If we were to release the pawl and there's any tension on the barrel here, uh, then you know, the barrel will want to spin on its own and the thing will come, you know, sort of crashing down. And that's <laughs> that's one way to get things down. And a lot of like, you know, low tension lifting winches like you'd buy at a, you know, a, a Harbor Freight or something like that, have a mechanism for releasing the pull so that, you know, when you're doing, you know, low load work, you can just sort of like pull on the thing, spool some line out, get, get it to be where you want it to be, uh, and then re-engage the pull so you can lift it again. And that's fine. Um, a lot of times you see these referred to as pulling winches, um, meant for like pulling your boat up onto your boat trailer or something like that. Uh, so if I if I release the pole here, it's totally disengaged. If I pull on the barrel, you can see that it it revolves kind of jerkily, but it does move. The, lo the load lowers, the load is released because the pole is totally disengaged. So that's one way to counter the action of the pole. But the problem with this in the context that we're thinking, right, is now we have no difference between the thing you know we, we've, we've cranked this thing down we've lifted our weight up what we'd really like is a way to slowly and gracefully lower the load and disengaging our ratcheting pole is just not not gonna do that so much um so we get to the clever part about this design and as i show it off you're gonna notice the issue with the design as well so i mentioned earlier that this ratcheting this ratchet wheel is not directly connected to this shaft. It's actually separate from. Let me take this apart a little bit here. Um, similarly, this end cap that the handle is attached to, and ultimately this is the component that would be coupled to a stepper motor or something when we turn this into a motorized winch, right? This piece is actually threaded onto a thread that is integral with the shaft. 
right? So I take that off, you can see I have a, a threaded section there, and I have a 3D printed threaded section inside of that. And then I have these two rubber, essentially, washers. Um, this is actually a, a section of a, a gasket, this is a, a nice grippy material, um, that live on either side of this ratchet wheel. So we had handle section, gasket one, free-floating ratchet wheel, right? You can see this is actually a separate piece that's not connected to this central shaft. And then another piece of that gasket material, sort of forming a, a friction washer, if you will. And then this is all one continuous section. So this thread, this bearing surface, this shoulder surface that just keeps everything in place. Um, and then this center shaft, this is all one continuous piece. I guess the only piece that is not this, uh, this is a screw that screws into this end. And I... <laughs> I did that so I could insert the rest of this shaft through the other way and then screw this screw in to get it to stay. What I didn't realize is I was when I was ready to put a thread in it, I just sort of drilled a hole arbitrarily in one end just to put a, uh, a bit of thread through. And uh, I actually have drilled through the screw body. The head of the screw ends like right here. Um, <laughs> and so to take this screw out, I actually have to unthread this, which I will do in a moment, but... <laughs> It's a little bit silly. But you see, this is all one rigid assembly, but the rest of these pieces are not. So how does that help us? Well, let me do a little bit of reassembly here. I'll put our friction washer back in. I'll put our, our free-floating ratchet back in. I'll put our fat friction washer back in, and we'll thread our handle on here. All right, so it's just making a nice... So you can see, once we've... As we screw this in clockwise, which, remember, is our up direction, right? At some point, it's threaded down enough that it starts to make contact with our friction surfaces. And when it does, this we start to get friction between this gasket and the, the ratchet wheel, between the ratchet wheel and this gasket. Make sure that's nice and well seated on there. It actually doesn't, doesn't look like it's in the right place. Yeah, there we go. Um, and once we have enough friction, right, rather than being able to thread down any further, we'll start to turn the whole mechanism, right? And normally this would be in the direction of the ratchet. So if I re-engage the ratchet here, re-engage our pole, we'll see that as I turn, it's the action of this, right? It's threaded down far enough, it's causing friction between these parts, and that's what's translating motion to our, our barrel, right? Now, the, the part of this is, I mean, this is all talking about, like, how do we get this thing to come back down uh, when we want it to? So, in a situation where we have load on our barrel here, right? So, if I put a little load on this string representing it lifting itself or lifting something else, right? We're putting uh, tension onto this ratchet wheel and pole arm. So what happens if I start to turn the handle in the other direction? And for the sake of demonstration, um, just because it's a little bit finicky to hold onto this string, I think I'm actually just going to snip it off and use uh, something else to put tension on there. Maybe like a little file or something. Yeah. Let me grab my little my little rat tail file or maybe a little tiny screwdriver yeah that'll be that'll be the trick so i'm just going to insert this screwdriver through the hole there just gets me easier for me to hold this way and put tension on it so uh let's see if i'm going to crank it up this way then i'm going to be putting load back in the other direction right so my screwdriver my screwdriver hand is now representing the load on the system and i can still fight myself right i can still crank this down and crank crank the system up, but just as soon as I release, we fall back into that ratchet wheel, and this, this load is pulling it back down. Until, in theory, I start to loosen this handle. And when I do, when I loosen this handle, we're reducing the friction that's present at each of these two points, right? So we're getting less friction between the handle wheel and the ratchet wheel, between the ratchet wheel and the barrel. Um, and so once there is little enough friction, Right. Once there's little enough friction between the ratchet wheel and the shaft, the shaft will actually start to be able to slip backward, right? Because the only thing holding it in place now is the friction of these parts. But the clever thing, and we'll see if we can get it to work, and this is one of the problems we'll try and solve tonight, right? And so I'm applying pressure to the screwdriver here, I'm applying a counter rotation to the handle, and you can sort of see those two parts moving together. So what's happening is as I as I rotate this handle counterclockwise, I'm slightly unscrewing it from the barrel thread. And that's causing there to be less friction here. And at some point, this barrel will slip. But when it slips, remember that's attached to these threads. So when the barrel slips backward, it actually tightens 
this thread a little bit. And so it stops moving. So the lowering process essentially is a continual action of this, this rotates counterclockwise, loosens the thread. This load causes the barrel to move, which tightens the thread. Loosens thread, tightens thread, loosens thread, tightens thread. And so with a smooth enough motion, right, it should just feel like it's, it's a little bit sticky, but I'm not even really able to perceive, even holding this by hand, the like the the jerkiness that would be like tighten, loosen, tighten, loosen. It just feels like a continuous a continuous slip, and that's the goal. So this is the mechanism by which a lot of like manual chain hoists move. Um, when you know when you think of a chain hoist, you like pull the chains one way, and your your load chain goes up, and you pull the chains the other way, and your load goes down. This is exactly how they work. Right, you're pulling in one direction to to tighten and lift your load, and then when you you uh, crank the other way, and whatever your mechanism is, you're reducing friction, and then the load is reapplying that friction. That so that's the mechanism in a nutshell. Um, I, not my original one, right? It's just totally ripped off of like lifting winches and chain winches and all that kind of good stuff. But it does seem to work pretty well. Um, and in terms of structural integrity, right? This is not a terribly bulky mechanism um my test weight that i've been playing around with is i just what was handy it's a pound of solder right i have a pound of kester solder here um that it lifts no problem um but and the problem is and then so coming back to like what we're going to work on tonight it lifts no problem um but in a situation where this is being held up by this we have a pound of force being applied to this barrel and it turns out the biggest flaw so far is that the barrel surface where it contacts this frame is a is a PLA on PLA bearing and it's just too it's just too much. It's too sticky. I filed it and sanded it nice and smooth. I oiled it with a couple of different greases and oils and it's there's just too much friction there to be able to you know if I'm cranking it by hand, the extra force of my cranking is able to overcome it, but in coming back down, even when I like took the handle all the way off and took the ratchet off, just the friction of barrel on frame meant that the solder was just hanging in the air forever. So what we're going to work on tonight is improving that bearing surface um, and actually implementing an interface that incorporates a couple of these guys. These are skateboard bearings, um, which are a, have become very popular in or were popular at the time in 3D printed projects because they're they're really cheap and they're pretty good bearings for axles. Um, they're, they're not like, you know, super duper high quality, but they're good enough for our purposes. And so we're going to try integrating these. I will look up exactly which size these are that I ordered because I've had these for a couple of years, frankly. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think that'll be a good way to go. And so we'll, we'll need to adjust the frame. So it has a hole for this outer surface. We'll adjust the barrel. So it mates this inner surface here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thomas. Yeah. We're right on the same page, right? I need a, a proper bearing or something. Yeah. I could have done like a nylon or like a PTFE. Um, do like a, you know, a, a, a super slippy, uh, plastic bearing, but I think we're just going to go straight to these metal bearings here. And this, I should say, so like, you know, obviously this project is currently taking shape as the hand crank version of this project. The goal ultimately is still to do it with a stepper motor, right? So we have fine control of position. Um, but I figured it'd be a lot easier to experiment with and learn about if I could do it in sort of a, like a, a slightly bulky handheld form factor. And then we can make it compact, we can scale it down, we can figure out what the coupling is to a stepper motor, we can figure out if we need, and I suspect we will, if we need a gear reduction mechanism between the shaft and a stepper motor. Um, because part of the thing about this design as built is any, the, the, the motor is directly feeling the lifting force required to lift the device. There is no gear reduction built into this currently. I mean, currently I have a little mechanical advantage just based on the size of this handle, which is you know, kind of, kind of inconveniently big, um, but that'll be something to think about. Is you know, do we need some kind of small gearbox or gear reduction or something like that to get enough power? Um, and that'll sort of depend on the motor we use. I have a small stepper motor picked out that I think will be nice in a form factor like this, but um, I, I'm not even going to bother getting that out at the moment because I think we we got a couple more steps to get to before there. But yeah, that's what we're going to work on. Just to share a couple of like things, like intermediate steps, which I thought were kind of interesting. Um, oh yeah, so this is, <laughs> I mentioned, right, the the first design, I had, it, it sort of doesn't matter which way your ratchet goes, right? It could be a, a left leading ratchet or it could be a right leading ratchet. And so, um, let's see, 
So this is my initial print, and this one had a ratcheting arm that went up the other side, whereas this went up the right side, whereas this one goes up the left side. Um, and I didn't realize until I had printed it, that it actually does matter which way your ratchet goes, because the relation of the ratchet to the screw thread in this design is super critical, right? The direction of uh, freedom of motion of the ratchet has to correspond to the direction of tightening of the thread. So in this case, I either needed a left side ratchet and a right-handed thread, a standard thread, or could mirror the entire design. I could do a, a right-handed ratchet and a left-handed, a reverse thread if I really wanted to, but I didn't want to. So here we are. But you'll see as we get into the drafting later today, I didn't realize that until after I had done the bulk of the design. So one of the last steps in the Fusion 360 file was just to take most of the parts of this and mirror them 180 degrees. So at some point, if it looks like the model is backward from what reality is, it probably is. Um, I'm trying to keep that basically the very last step on the timeline. So I'm actually drafting in reverse and then mirroring it at the end because that seems to be the cleanest way to do it at this point. Um, Oh yeah, Thomas, I, Thomas I, I would welcome your advice on stepper motors because you've been working with them much more regularly than I have. Even small ones put a surprisingly amount of torque, especially if you give them more voltage. Oh, that's a good thought. Yeah, I have, to be honest, I haven't thought very far through the like power delivery and control schema for this thing at all, but, but that will certainly be a, a, a bridge to cross and also something to probably test. Um, so yeah, so we'll, but we'll, we will certainly get there. Um, the only other like intermediate design that I thought was kind of interesting and sort of minimal is this was the, the first ratchet that I came up with. And this one actually held a surprising amount of weight. I was trying to come up with a design that used no external parts, like no, have every part be 3D printed. And that's what this achieves, right? This is a, a 3D printed pole. Um, I just immediately lost confidence <laughs> in the strength of this thing because it's so slim. Um, and there probably is a design that with the right materials and enough iteration like would have a you know a shape that was fully 3d printed didn't need any any extra hardware um and but i, I just figured like for the sake of like strength i'd rather print a kind of a, a stouter pole arm and then I, I have access to a ton a ton of these little springs i mean you can get them at any hardware store um we've got dozens and dozens of types from old hardware both both here at home and at the museum just from like you know projector uh, slide projectors from the 90s that we don't have any of anymore but we still have to repair kits so stuff like that um so anyway this might still be a cool goal is to have an option excuse me that's entirely 3d printed but that let's make that a let's call that a stretch goal i think um oh yeah and then i added some mounting holes at one point because you know if you're lifting a pound of weight then there's going to be a pound of force lifting up on this mechanism and so i figured having some way to mount it when we're experimenting would be would be kind of useful so yeah that's what i've got i i this I, mechanism i'm like i say it's not mine i just think it's quite clever um oh here another thing to string off you can see that this is indeed just a thread just a 3d printed thread i also i did some experiments i i don't have the testing block here um, I did some experiments with 3D printed threads this week as well, because I have not used them particularly much. Um, just, uh, you know, you, you can see where I accidentally drilled through the end of my bolts when I was drilling that string mounting hole. Um, it got, threw me off too. I was like, why, why can't I, I, this bolt is like seized or something? How can I not get it out? Oh, oh, I've drilled through it. Um, this is just built using Fusion 360's, um, thread tool right there you can there's a, a thread operation there's also a hole operation that has threading options um this is an m10 thread right a metric size 10 thread course um and so i ran some tests just like how how small a thread can one make with a uh with a prusa mini uh with a standard 0.4 millimeter nozzle right because I, I just didn't have any reference um but i i figured there would be a, a lower limit and it seems to be um, with a with a standard ISO metric thread, right, without modifying anything, about an M8 or an M9 internal and external thread is about as small as, as one can go, at least as small as I can go with that standard nozzle. Um, now, of course, right, this thread is meant to be optimized to, um, you know, in some senses, like, maximize the size of the the body like the shaft of this because this bolt is assumed to need some mechanical strength when you're talking about a metal bolt that the iso is going to spec um but of course for this application we don't really care about the strength of the 
of the shaft, we care about the threads. And so I, I have not experimented yet with like custom threading, and there's a few different ways that we could do that, one of which would just be to use the coil tool and basically custom etch an internal and a matching external thread, right? And that would allow us to have a thread that was, say, this diameter, which is really what I'm interested in, right? I want something about this size, this diameter, but it could have much, much coarser threads that would be easier to print at this scale. So, in any case, just some, that was that was my my determination is an M9 thread, which is what this is, is about as small as I can go. An M10, which is what this is, is is fine. M8 is a little bit um, a little, a little bit too small for the setup that I've got going, or at least, at least as, as I was slicing it in my current setup, it was a little bit problematic. Um, so <laughs> get some great 3D printed bolts. I, I would be impressed, um, if you get that kind of a strength rating out of a 3D printed part. I, I sort of doubt it. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's get into the drafting a little bit, because that's going to be like kind of the main, my main work focus of tonight. Get myself situated here move a big box of batteries out of the way. Let's see here. So this is the, move the mouse over somewhere where it's useful. Um, this is the, obviously the, the Fusion 360 design for this project. Make sure the mouse is visible. Yeah, there we go. Um, and I've, <laughs> I color coded the materials to roughly match the physical, what the physical model ended up as just to be a little bit easier to track. Um, but you can see it's, you know, it's got all the, all the parts we were talking about. It's got, you know, we can break it back down, right? So this, the base is mostly what we'll be working on. So this is that center barrel. It's a little bit of a complicated part. It's got the central barrel shaft. Ooh, I should, I should put a, a hole in here in the 3D print rather than having to drill a hole after the fact. That'd be pretty silly. Hey, broke both. <laughs> Good to see you. We're, we're causing, causing a little chaos here. Um, let's see. On to that go. So that's our, that's our M what I say, M10 thread. Let's load that up. Yeah, so you can see that's the, th and the nice thing about using Fusion's built-in tools, right, is that in a common, because it's based on the ISO standards, it comes with tolerancing built-in, right? So you can see there's a small gap between the internal and external threads of this part. Um, and this I did using the, just the, you know, the built-in Fusion 360 thread tool, uh, 10 millimeter isometric profile, 1.5 millimeter pitch, you know, all, all the usual stuff. Um, I didn't model the spring. No, I wasn't sure what I, so this is another thing. It was like, I wasn't entirely sure what the, like what kind of tension I would need on these springs. Um, so I, I actually have a few of them lying around here that I was experimenting with. And this is, this is just one that seems to work pretty well. You can also see it's, you can tell there, there's a little hook down here that it's clipped onto. I actually clipped it a couple of coils in from the end because I wanted just a little bit more tension there. So I just sort of like, clink, clink and clipped it a little bit, so it's a, a little bit stiffer of a spring now. Um, let's see, let's go back to our, our overall view here. So then we've got our, our ratchet wheel. I also didn't model the friction washers because that's been very much an experimental thing. We've got our ratchet wheel that sits there. We've got our, what I'm calling the handle wheel because it's the wheel that has a handle on it. Ultimately, this will be the part that has the coupler to a motor of some kind, separate motor probably. Um, we have our frame, and that's mostly what we'll be modifying tonight. Um, so that's got our, our mounting base. It's got this, this little hooky guy down here for hooking the spring onto, uh, mounting hole for our pawl post, um, and then some holes into which our barrel is mounted in, in a minute where our, um, uh, where our bearings will be mounted. Think about some things there. Um, we have our pawl assembly, which is actually in three parts. Let's come in here. All right, so on our pawl, we have the pawl arm, which engages with the ratchet wheel and sits on the pawl shaft. And that shaft is a, a, it's just a circular shaft at the end. It's got a shoulder for the pawl to rest against, and then just a square hole here to pass through the, the frame. You can see there's that cotter pin hole that I just didn't bother to use this time. Um, and then to cap that off, we have our cap screw. I think this one is M9. And as you saw earlier, it's not a great fit. So I think I will probably either revise that or think of some other way of encapsulating this pole at this point. Um, and then the handle, right? Which is just for now, just need a way to, to crank it on down. So yeah, that's, that's the design. Let's think about how we want to get our... Um, 
get our ratchet into it. Um, let's see. Oh, it's not our ratchet, our bearings. So let's get some measurements on those bearings first. I think that'll be a good place to start. There we go. I don't I don't know how well the like the chill tunes come through for y'all. Um they're they're certainly in my ears. I you know, I mess with the volume sometimes because people are like, "Oh, they're they I can't hear them at all. You have tunes or oh, they're super super loud." In any case, one of the tracks uh has some like aesthetic static on it, and it freaks me out every time cuz I'm like, "What? Why where is the static coming from?" Oh, it's it's in the tunes. So this is a 22 millimeter outer diameter bearing by what I'm going to guess is an eight millimeter inner diameter because I, you know, of course the two points of those calipers are not directly opposite each other. 22 by eight by seven. It's going to be our dimensions here. Actually, before I designed these, because I had them a couple years, let me take something to just shove in there and make sure these still turn freely. Yeah, that's pretty good. Maybe you can see that there, but that seems pretty decent. Don't the numbers in the bearing indicate size, says Chris? They do. Um, this is a, this is what I've got for markings on there. It's blowing way out there. That is a, uh, I see here, hang on. I'm gonna adjust the camera settings again. We'll just hopefully we don't ruin anything. Yeah, so you don't get that crazy overexposure. Yeah, so that's a 608ZZ bearing. Um, I think, I believe a 608, I, like I say, I bought these a couple years ago. My memory is that 608 is a pretty standard size and I'm sure if someone wanted to look, there would be, would be standard dimensions. Um, cause there are multiple sizes of, of relatively standard. Um, but 22 outer, uh, eight inner by seven thick is what these seem to be. Um, eight millimeter inner, inner diameter, 20, 21 millimeter OD. Mine are, mine are pretty definitely 22. 20, my, a little, at least the ones that I've got are 22 seven. Um, but I don't know. I also don't remember if the ZZ makes a difference. So 608 ZZ. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, Thomas, your guess is better than mine. I, I had no memory of what these might be. So here, let's turn off some parts and do some thinking. So the handle wheel doesn't come into play. The ratchet doesn't come into play. That end cap probably will. So one of the things that I'm thinking right away, as we think about how to integrate the bearings with this, right, is if the, the barrel is currently uh, 15 millimeters in diameter. And I don't really love the idea of shrinking the whole barrel down to eight millimeters to fit inside of the bearing. Um, and the other thing is now, and so like we could just shrink this section that is internal to the frame. Um, but then really that, that's the load bearing surface essentially, right? Um, it's just smaller. Uh, in that cross section. Now, I mean, so we could have like a thing that steps down, right? We could have a, a shaft that um, from here. Let's let's take this apart so we can look at the physical parts as we as we think about them. Get a little of this other detritus out of the way. So we've got an old friction washer. We don't need that. So we've got our our wheel, our washer, our ratchet. Take the pawl off. We've got our other washer. Ah, Thomas says ZZ refers to the metal shielding covering the internal ball bearings. The other type is RS, which is a rubber seal, which can be easily removed. I see. So because I've got this like metal washer gasket cap thing there, that's that's because it's a ZZ model. So thinking about this part here, right? Now we we could just sort of neck down the barrel at the points where it's surrounded by the shaft, right? We could make, we could make, uh, you know, so, so if this bearing is sitting in a slightly larger hole in here, right? That's the easy part. We'll put the bearing in there. It's a question of how does it interact with the shaft? Well, so we could, we could neck this down to eight millimeters, right? So there's a, it's, it's fat and then thin at the end here. And that's what sits inside of that bearing. Part of the problem is gonna be, how do we do that on this side unless the entire thing is eight millimeters, right? So like if this has to thread down or, you know, if, if there's a bearing sitting in a, a hole in the frame to be able to insert this shaft all the way through like we do, or like, like it currently assembles, 
then the whole shaft has to be the same um, inner di the same diameter as the inner diameter of this, which is eight millimeters. Which might be fine. Um, and I suppose, so I guess, let's see, what am I concerned about? I'm concerned about that being too small of an area to support the weight that this thing would want to support, right? And we could find a way of increasing the actual size of the barrel, right? If this was, you know, some kind of smaller eight millimeter shaft running through there, we could find a way to put a larger surface for the, um, yeah, yeah, Christy, exactly. Yeah, so uh, an eight millimeter shaft with a keyway and then a drum um, that mounts here in case you want some like additional, uh, you know, mechanical advantage on the line. Um, you know, and yeah, it could be a shaft with a key. Oh, I see. Shaft with keyway is actually quite clever. I was trying to was thinking of like maybe it's a two part clamshell that like clamps and screws. But having something with a uh, keyway that this just literally just slots right through as we insert it, that's quite clever. Um, we still have the question of like, is an eight millimeter surface sort of strong enough to support this? But I guess there's not really a great way to test that other than to just try it. Um, and it probably would be fine. I also, I was, I was very impressed with how well this initial mechanism held up to load. You know, I, I, like I say, I threw a pound of solder at it and it did just fine. And I think, uh, I think the shaft I did with three perimeters on my 0.4 millimeter nozzle. So not a, a no additional infill, so not a ton. And then I think this was just my default two perimeters, top, bottom, and side with 15% infill. Like stiffness wise, held up okay so yeah exactly chris if we were to beef up our perimeters or infill maybe on especially on the shaft part um and maybe on the the top part of the frame um could potentially help with that printed the right orientation eight millimeters can do a lot yeah for sure so part of the challenge there right is um because what one thing i discovered in my thread experiments this week and I, actually, I don't think i have the frame out where, where i learned this but printing you know if you're looking at looking down on my workbench right printing threads in this orientation works really well you have printing threads in this orientation right where the nozzle of course is your limiting factor for resolution didn't work great i think i i mentioned i had a version of this where um instead of this square mounting peg um i had a th another thread here so this this of course also printed like like this on the bed. Um, and I, I, so I had a, a thread in this frame printed in sort of this horizontal orientation. It really didn't turn out like not even, not even like I could sort of fudge it and adjust it. It just didn't, I just couldn't get the resolution at that, at that scale. And that was like an M9 thread. So like the limit of good in this orientation was unacceptable in this orientation, which is a shame because it means on the shaft part, right? The layer lines are sort of going the opposite direction that I would want them to, to your point, Cookie, right? Like if we're gonna either neck down or have a shaft, I'd want my layer lines going across my axle. And right now they're they're most likely to shear along, you know, sort of the, the short axis of that, of that barrel. So that's unfortunate. Could also, yeah, that's true. I could also thread them. Um, I do have a, ta a metric tap and die kit here somewhere it's probably in my drill bits collection um i mean i so i actually i have um a bunch of taps and dies at work i have a little set here they don't do that that much tapping of metal or wood at home but what i do have that i kind of like um here actually maybe maybe i will see if i can grab it real quick here uh you get to look at this handiwork brb We're back and we're unmuted, so it's going really quite well. Um, what I was going to show off and show off is a, a really cheap set of tools from Amazon, but um, they're kind of useful. Dave, I'm back. I see your comment, Dave. If you have, <laughs> Dave, I hope you brought enough paper airplanes for everybody. 
So what these are, and I believe this is my metric set, yeah. So these are metric drill and tap bits for a, a hand drill or, you know, impact driver, what have you. They're meant to be, so right, so they have, on each of them, they have a drill bit section at the front followed by a tap. Right, so the, the idea is that if you need a quick and dirty tap of something in the field, you, you have a section that drills your hole for you and then runs your tap. You could also probably put this into like an interchangeable screwdriver. That might be the kinder way to do it. Um, let's see, so I've got like, a, what are these? M4, M6, M8, M5, M10, M4, 5, 6, 8, 10. Um, and so like that would be a relatively easy way to tap a, you know, a plastic part. Um, although I don't, I, I suspect that the threads as printed, right? Oh, well, part of it is depth, right? I only tapped, I only threaded these down like 10 millimeters into the hole, which is less, you need, you need some clearance at the end of your process because of course you have to, you have to drill a deeper hole than you're tapping with these tools. So maybe that's actually not, a, not an ideal situation. But these have, these have saved my butt a couple of times. I haven't used them in a couple of years, but like, you know, you're in a, you're doing something in a theater and you need a threaded bolt to connect and something is stripped out and you just want to like put a quick and dirty threaded hole in something and get it done. That's not super load bearing. Works pretty well. And there's like a, like probably a $10 set of tools, like save your butt. It's not awful. Chris says, and Cookie, we have a completely hidden rod. I'm not entirely sure I understand. Um, like uh, having like an like an eight millimeter like non plastic like a metal rod or something that would be sort of our our primary bearing surface, um, and then maybe encapsulate either put a keyway in it or in other ways encapsulate it with a barrel. So part of the challenge, if, if assuming I've got that right, and I know lag is going to mean that I don't see your answer for a couple of seconds here, so I'll stall for time. Um, part of the nice thing about doing this all as one integral piece is that I can do things like form this shoulder, this bearing surface, and the thread, which has to have a really tight coupling to this shaft all in one piece. I mean, certainly there's a world in which like I we buy a shaft and then we like use a tap and die set to thread the end and put a shoulder on it, but I'm... <laughs> Given that my core competencies involve more 3D printing than uh, tapping metal, um, I'm not 100% sure I'd be successful there, but but it's possible. Let's, uh, I'll tell you what, we might do a, a few different versions of this. Let's experiment first with the version of this whole through entire printed shaft use brass slot to fill it out yeah so using some kind of like internal metal um supports probably or, or wood or something something strong lengthwise to fill out the actual structural strength i'm, I'm not opposed to that um if it's hollow like a pipe you don't have to worry about smaller diameter shearing due to orientation i see we do love a good brass rod yeah, this would be the second project in a row that i'm like i want a 3d printed thing but brass rod Press rod. Um, well, let's see here. Let's let's get about uh, modifying some of these parts because there's going to be some modifications that we have to make either way. So let's get rid of our shaft and end cap here. Go into our frame. Um, and I think this first one will be a relatively easy change. So now what? Let's roll. Let's roll our history. Our roll our timeline back. Roll history marker here. Yeah, so I think, I'm curious. It looks like I maybe didn't constrain the size of this hole. Oh, no, 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 I see. It's an offset from the hole that is part of the shaft itself. Ah, that's unfortunate. Um, so it looks like we'll maybe need to modify the shaft itself first because that's what the frame is taking its dimensions off of. So let's roll ourselves with it. And of course, because I was being a, a naughty boy, I didn't uh, put my my shaft parts in a component. They're just in the root of the project, which bad Jeff, bad Jeff. Okay, so, so there's our part. And this is where I thread the end, which I think is where I start working on the cap. Yeah. So let's start by, I think it's going to be our very first sketch of the thing. 
right? Instead of 15 millimeters, let's make this eight millimeters. Just make it nice, nice and small. I actually probably don't need this, this to be quite as big. Ah, uh, okay. So now one thing we'll have to think about is, right? It's saying I, it's not gonna be happy about me threading a 10 millimeter hole into the end of this here, because of course it is too small to fit a hole in. So let's, let's walk ourselves. I think the rest of this is fine. I think that shaft turned out fine. Um, ah, it looks like, uh, I, I, I'm thinking that the, the diameter of this worked out well, but it looks like in my project, I based those two shafts on the same size. So I'm actually gonna wanna go back and make this circle not, not the same diameter. Um, I want to make this back to being a 15 millimeter diameter shaft. And we'll make sure that that whole thing extrudes. So that's our bearing surface restored for our, our ratchet wheel. Now, what is it yelling me about me here? Uh, finish sketch. And then, so still our internal thread on this side is gonna be an issue. Um, they have to think about how, how with this smaller size, assuming that we can't necessarily 3D print an interior thread into this anymore to keep it captive. Could just do a cotter pin. So I'm thinking about how do we, you know, right now we're designing this silver part. How do we get a part that holds it captive in, in the mechanism once it's all said and done? Um, could be a cotter pin um, or some kind of, of, you know, captive pin device. Um, because this thread is just, I think it's going to be too small to be accomplishable at this, at, at an eight millimeter scale. Uh, yeah, let's, let's, maybe let's think about a cotter pin there for now. So I think that means, yeah, that I can eliminate actually quite a bit of this. I'm going to, I'm going to, instead of deleting these features, I'm just going to suppress them. Um, and I know that's going to screw things up for my, um, my my screw as it were in a second here it's gonna be very grumpy um because it's gonna have nothing to uh nothing to base its screw off of but that's okay because i don't need that screw anyway let's uh oops let's roll history marker here oh no it's doing this so this is, happens to me in fusion sometimes right where it all of a sudden will stop the history time the timeline will start acting up and it will let me move where i'm at in the timeline i might have to reboot fusion to get this to work uh, yeah, we'll just do that. Well, in the meantime, that's a good excuse for a little, uh, a little hydration break. Cotter pin prevent that bolt from accidentally loosening up. Oh, so Chris, I was saying, so I could do a cotter pin through this bolt if I could put it, but I think given that this is going to go from a 15 millimeter diameter shaft in the, in the current thinking to an eight millimeter diameter shaft, that's going to be too small for me to actually put a a 3D printed at least thread in the end of it. Get fusion starting back up there. Um, and so maybe it's just the shaft becomes extra long and we just put a cotter pin right through the end of it here to keep it keep it in place. I'm not a huge fan of that because of the friction potential that it has on, on the frame. Um, whereas this, I guess it's not really any worse necessarily than you know, a threaded bolt head that could also rub on the frame. Um, as long as we leave a little bit of in-shake there, um, that would probably be okay. All right, we've got Fusion back. Let's pull up our winch project here and see if it will be... Uh, it's still being grumpy at the time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unsuppress... Some of these features. There we go. That seems to have been happier. Now, can I move on the timeline? I can. All right. Well, we're just going to turn that cap screw off and not worry about it too much. Um, so this could be our new shaft design. Now, of course, at the end, I think probably once we have the frame built, we'll take this shaft and make it a little bit longer and put that cotter pin through it. But let's roll our timeline all the way to the end now. Maybe we'll just do that right now. So we'll roll our timeline to the end. Here is our flip operation. I guess we could just do it after that. That'd be okay. Oh yeah, and there's my Paul operation too. Oh, it's got, it's so short. It's so wee. 
When did that happen? Oh, you know what? I probably did. I probably like broke something with, there was an extrusion that was cutting. Uh, I, 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 for some reason, I'd forgotten that there was a hole tool in Fusion 360 that will thread for you. So I was doing a sketch and then an extrusion, like an extrude cut into the device, into the shaft and then threading that, which is very silly. So it's part of like reducing the size of that, but I broke something as part of that sketch, but that's okay. Cause we have to come and make this longer anyway. So we'll make ourselves an offset plane. Let's make it extend, I don't know, five millimeters past the end of this thing. Um, and we will just extrude our shaft to that plane, hide that plane. Um, and then we'll do a plane at angle on that surface. Oop, no, we'll do a tangent plane on that surface. Yes. And on that, we'll do a sketch. And of that sketch, we will make a projection of our shaft. We'll do a center line as our center line. On that center line, we'll do a little hole. Now, my cotter pins are about two millimeters in diameter. So let's call this 2.3 millimeters. And we will offset this here and let's put it uh one point now the the pawl is only like a 2.5 or 3 millimeter thick like the, the ratchet wheel itself is not that big and we want to keep it in pretty good alignment with the pawl itself so let's give ourselves like a millimeter of inshake here so we'll say one millimeter plus the radius of this circle um i think that'll be okay Excellent, and then we'll just cut that. I probably could have done this with the whole whole uh, whole tool as well, um, but we'll just cut that there. Oops. Why you know want to cut? Cut. All right. So there's our cotter pin hole. I'm not gonna model, Chris. I'm not gonna model the cotter pin either. I'm sorry. We'll do, just do crimes. Um. So that could be. Oh, interesting. Look at something. Something has become disconnected here because these holes are now are significantly bigger. Ah, Cookie's got good advice. What does Cookie say? Uh, problem I ran into at five millimeters with a cotter pin hole made the shaft weak. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, let's have a look at that. Um, yeah, I see what you mean. Now, ideally, uh, in this scenario, right, where we have the bearing will sit inside the frame sort of here, and the weight will all be central here, that the, the presence of this cotter pin hopefully won't compromise things too much. Might also just be a matter of like, we really have to increase our perimeter count um, to get this to, to be strong enough. But that's a, that's a fair point. <laughs> Chris has put the big master the pin. I certainly could. I have a stock of cotter pins here somewhere and I know that they're about two millimeters wide. I'm just going to use one of them. Yeah, Cookie, that's when I, that's, to be honest, I, I'm hoping it's okay. This is definitely going to be a thing. So I, I think what we'll do tonight is get this roughed in, take a slice of this frame and do a test print and and maybe a test print of uh, like a shaft section and a frame section and fit things together. Maybe we'll do a test section that has this cotter pin and we can just kind of roughly assess how much it's affecting thing. Two-part shaft collar, what's Chris say? Two-part shaft collar clamp instead of pin. Oh, could do. I mean, at some point, I don't know that I have any of these, but um, we could also do like a retaining clip um, as opposed to a pin. Um, what uh, What is the, God, here we go. Pins, is that what I'm thinking of? There's a, a specific type of like pin that I'm, I know I have in, not here, but I could borrow, I could borrow one from work. Um, in my collection that's like a hair, hairpin clip. This is what I was thinking. I guess it could also be a stronghold cotter pin, but like, because we're not gonna be putting that much lateral force, that's not actually a life safety application, right? We could put a clip like this across the across the shaft. Um, maybe we do like a two millimeter in, like a, an indent all the way around and we clip it instead of pinning it. Um, I think that's a fun idea. Uh, let's see, what's gonna be the cleanest way to model that I wonder I, mean, I could do a I could do an offset sketch and then a cut just trying to think if there's a better way 
Uh, I could do it. <laughs> I could do it as an emboss. Um, yeah, I think what we'll do. So we'll. We, I think I said we wanted a millimeter of offset there. Let's say, and then we'll do a sketch on that plane. We will intersect. Uh, intersect the shaft with our sketch. And then let's just hide that. Um, and what I will do is say I want a, this is really just gonna be to like help keep that pin in the right place. So we'll say like minus 0.3, finish sketch, and then we will extrude that surface. I don't, let's see if this, if this MasterCard sample tells me the wire diameter for an arbitrary one of these for, oh, it's a gosh, of course they're all Imperial. What is eight millimeters in inches? Uh, 3.157, that's like five sixteenths, right? Five sixteenths. Yeah, just about exactly five sixteenths. So for a, a example five sixteenth hairpin clip, the wire diameter is, <laughs> is Oh, except I want the wire opening to be 5 sixteenths. Oh, do I? No, I want the wire opening to be slightly smaller. I want the wire opening to be a quarter inch for a 5 sixteenths shaft. The wire diameter is 3 sixty-fourths of an inch. Um, so this is going to be 3 sixty-fourths of an inch. Uh, let's do 4 sixty-fourths, which is 1 sixteenth of an inch. Um, there we go. Yeah, ret yeah retaining clip. Is the, I guess what I was trying to think of. E-clip. Let's actually, now that we have that as a, a possible diameter, instead of doing this as an offset, let's do this as a proper diameter, where we say that if this is a 5 16th, a 5 16th nominal clip, um, that this in... Now why? That's not a driven dimension. Maybe something was, was constrained that shouldn't have been. One quarter times one inch. It's actually slightly smaller there. Oops, <laughs> that's not that's not gonna work. Do that. Yeah, so that'll so we'll put a, a quarter inch diameter retaining clip there. And maybe that'll be a little bit stronger than or maybe it won't be stronger. Maybe that'll be weaker <laughs> than having the, the cotter pin. But I think it's a I think it's worth a try. This is also if this does work, we could fabricate a quick and dirty retaining clip out of plastic. Right, we could. It wouldn't have to be a McMaster car product. We could do this as a 3D printed part, which I kind of like. I oh, I see, Chris. It was still an offset. Thank you. Um, all right. So that's maybe our shaft. Um, and you know, while I'm looking at it, I'm actually going to go back in here and make give us a little bit more in shape. Because one thing that I uh, what I learned. Is so I when I printed this part, this shaft originally, I was already worried that I wasn't having, I wouldn't have enough surface present on the bed to really get good adhesion. And that's partly because I had this internal thread here, so like this is printing like that, you know. Um, and I was worried that just this I'd have adhesion issues, so I actually did a support enforcer. I did selective supports just around this inner surface. And you can see that actually works really quite well. I just had this one little spot where it wasn't super clean, but even that and some of the uncleanly un uncleanliness, some of the mess down here eats up a little bit of the clearance I had built in. Like it, you know, I, I, this this shoulder is not sitting quite as snug to this frame as it could. Um, and so I think I'm gonna give myself a little bit extra inshake. Inshake being a term I totally stole from the Clickspring YouTube channel who makes excellent clocks and other mechanisms. And if you don't watch Clickspring, Clickspring and you watch my channel, go subscribe to Clickspring, they're great. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna give myself a little bit extra clearance there to try and solve some of that issue. And that's be just a, a little bit over a millimeter there. Do a quick save and let us move on to modifying this frame. Let's go to the frame here. I'm just gonna hide my shaft. And if I come here, so this is, I think, ultimately what's going to be punched as my hole. Yeah, so let's make this 22. I want this to be a really tight fit. I'm gonna say 22.1 millimeters, I think is safe. Let's see, did that, is that really 22.1 millimeters? Oops, not that, uh, here, 22.1. Yes, okay, so I need to I need to beef out the rest of this frame a little bit. Beef out being, uh, you know, a technical term. 
Uh, let's see. Now, what's defining our dimensionality here? Nothing. It's just kind of free-floating. Well, let's make the frame of this a little bit wider. We'll make it, let's see, let's say we want five millimeters of space. So we'll say five plus the, the radius of that circle. Oops. Ah, let's make sure that this circle is locked in place first, though. Concentric to this guy. And we'll make this five plus radius. There we go. Let's see what else we broke. Ah! <laughs> yeah, it's not ideal, is it, huh? Um, let's... So already we've gone wrong in this extrude, and it's because I projected the ratchet wheel in. Um, ah, this needs to be tangent out here. Yeah, a lot of missing constraints in here that I was apparently just getting away with. Oh, that's better. Should we go for gusto? Let's go all the way to the end and see how it looks. Yeah? Yeah, that looks pretty good. And then I think the other thing I might need to adjust is we said that the the depth of these bearings, I think, was seven millimeters. Seven just just a tiny bit over seven, perhaps. I mean that's for for these crappy calipers, that's probably within tolerance. So let's let's call it seven millimeters. I think these walls are not where nowhere close to seven millimeters. Maybe five. Five millimeters, yeah. So we'll want to we'll want to thicken those up a little bit here. So let's come back here and we'll do minus seven point two. Let's say. Now let's see how we did. Uh, got some errors. What do we got here? What has gone wrong? Visually, it all looks okay. Something's probably just not projecting right. Oh yes, because my my sketch is still including my old my old threaded example, which is no longer no longer accurate. But that's okay. Ah, uh, we should make sure that this this extrude lines up, and that's probably one of my later ones. You can see I've got a, sort of a stepped thing going on there that I don't want. Uh, let's see. I think it's this. Uh, yes, I know you can see. Yes, of course. I'm bouncing back and forth uh, between being mirrored and not as we jump around this timeline. Uh, something is also not right there. Let's see here. Oh, I remember something, something very strange happened in the modeling of this. Even though I projected in my existing body, I still had like some weird gaps in the extrude, um, which is also why it's extruding. You may have noticed in that extrude, it's a distance extrude instead of an extrude to face. Um, because I couldn't get it to join otherwise, weirdly enough. Um, 7.1? Yeah, something like that. Oh, yes, I see. Thank you, Chris. You lacking constraints. Yeah, very casual design, it turns out. And now I'm looking at it, I kind of want these, these to be... I guess the primary load in most applications is going to be upward, or, you know, uh, in this direction, away from the thing. I extruded more than the 7, says Chris. Oh, yeah, a 7 plus a little bit this in this dimension here. 7.2, I think, is what you're looking at. And that'll be okay. I just want a little bit a little bit of extra plastic hanging out on either on either side. Now I haven't really thought about how exactly we would how exactly would we hold this bearing in place. I mean it could be a friction fit. Um or it could be like a set screw something or other. Let's do, we'll do our sample, our test print and see how it turns out if we need to think about some way to lock this in place. I'm sort of hoping that if this is snug enough, and as I say that, I'm actually going to go back in here and make this diameter just a really a flat 22 millimeters, which will be too small, and we'll file it out to be a perfect fit for our bearing. I think that's going to be the way to go. Uh, yeah, that should be, so we'll, we would still have to think about whether we want to add, like, a 3D printed barrel to actually capture the, the cable in here in addition to our, our shaft. Um, but I think what I want to do now is get some test prints going. So let us remember to roll our timeline all the way to the end, and we will export some things and slice them and get them printing. Because so, I'm curious, like, this is all about, a lot of this tonight, right, is about mechanical fitment with, like, this particular bearing. So let's get some test prints going and we'll learn very quickly if we're on the right track or if there's things we need to change. So, let's see, I'm going to need our frame. Uh, so we will 
save our frame. And as always, <laughs> I, for some reason, decided long ago that I like to have copies of all of my STLs and my, um, my G-code files. So instead of like sending these straight to the print mechanism, I just save them. <laughs> I save them to a file and import them. Uh, and we'll export our winch shaft as well. And then we will import, let's do these one at a time. So we'll import our frame. We'll fix, <laughs> fix its orientation there. And then we'll use the built-in slicing functionality here to take a chunk. Cause I just, I really only care about this portion of the print here, right? So, oops, I've accidentally thrown this out into, into Never Never Land. Uh, so we will keep the upper part cut. And now we'll do a rotate there and we'll do another cut. I'll we'll keep just the upper part. And that'll be our little section that we get to play with of that. And now let's bring in, oh, that was our, oh no, that was the wrong frame section. That was the frame from the other day. Dang. Uh, let's go get the new frame section and we'll do those same cuts. So we will get the orientation right. We'll do our cut. <laughs> oh, that track that has the static in it is back in my ears. Like I said, I don't know if anyone out there can actually hear it, but like all of a sudden there's just like two seconds of mysterious crackling. Um, and then the music kicks in and it gives me a, a bit of a heart. I should really just get rid of it. All right, there's that cut. So now let's bring in our shaft section. Um, and similarly, we're gonna do a cut and take just, just a chunk off the top there, perform cut, okay. And there we go. So for the sake of testing size, I'm gonna leave the print settings uh, as default. In fact, I'm gonna put them to 0.2 millimeters and speed. Um, 26 minute print, that's that's totally fine. Yeah, Chris, you totally called it. I absolutely was picking the wrong file. So let us, Export some G-code. Uh, this is the 11th. We'll export that. All right, well, that's a that's good progress. Um, let me get my mic cable sorted out here. What have I done? Oh, I see. I think when I ran away on that tangent about uh, Oh, I, see. I was like, why is the lights to the printer off? It's because, like I said earlier, I unplugged them. But I can plug them back in. I have the technology. There we go. Okay, printer's back on. We'll retrieve our flash drive. We'll get it preheating. Looks like these test prints are going to be in blue because that's the color that's currently loaded in my printer. Oh, you're probably getting real, real up close and personal there. That's probably better. All right, let's grab, grab our G code. We'll stick it on the flash drive. Gosh, which I absolutely need to clear out. Checked. And there we go. Uh, let's get back over to ye oldie printer. Plug in, and as always, I will do a clean of the bed with some isopropyl before we start the print. Just, I I do it every every single time, and I, I rarely sad about it. It's funny, I had a, um, I had a print at work fail on Friday afternoon, like right before I left. Um, and I was like, oh man, that's, wow, that, un, that's unusual. I wouldn't say it's like we, we, you know, prints fail for all kinds of reasons. This one, I, I, like I say, Friday afternoon, right before I left. So I didn't bother to troubleshoot it too deeply, but I believe what happened is that the PLA filament snapped inside the Bowden tube, um, causing a, an extrusion failure. Um, which is unfortunate. Now it is a roll of, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not junk PLA. I think it's eSun that's currently loaded in there. Um, but just keep that shaft in the middle of the bearing hole. Oh, I totally could have Thomas. You're totally right. Yeah, I could. There's no reason these two have to necessarily be separate. That's pretty funny. Um, 
But yeah, I, I something I hadn't seen before, and like, oh, actually, that's not true. I have seen PLA snap inside the Bowden tube. We, <laughs> I got some like, I, it's on me. I got some really dirt cheap PLA from Amazon. It was like three rolls for forty five bucks, a white, a gray, and a black, and they're just, they're so dry, they're so brittle, um, and uh, they, it, it, so on my bigger selects they do okay, but on the Prusa Mini, which is a pretty tight Bowden tube radius, they just crack. They're really awful. So I don't really, I, I don't know what they don't really use them for anything anymore. Um, but this stuff that cracks in the Bowden tube at work on Friday, which I, I thought of because it's blue, like the blue that I'm using here, different brand, is like is eSun, which is a decent, it's a decent brand. It's like not, it's not fancy Hatchbox Galaxy fancy sparkle. Uh, PLA filament, but it's like not bottom of the barrel either. So I'm excited to go in tomorrow morning and sort out what's going on there. Um, Cause we're using some 3D printing to get some more exhibits back online. Um, and I gotta get that printer printer back up and on and on on fleek, as they say, as the as the teens still say. I don't know if teens still say on fleek. Maybe that's just a thing that us olds say now. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah, shall we see if that uh, if that would have been a shorter print? So like this was a 26 minute print. If I move this in here and slice, that becomes a, well, it's still, a, if it is a shorter print, this is also 26 minutes. So if it is shorter, it's by the margin of error of rounding to, to a minute, but it's not a bad idea. Uh, yeah. The other thing that I, oh, you know what? I, one thing I didn't, I, I should do as long as we're looking at this drafting, um, and maybe we'll just get rid of that view for now is uh, should come down to the poll and adjust the position of the, yeah, the, the length of this potentially, but also the cutter. Oh no, actually look at, hey, a thing I actually properly constrained for once, uh, this frame got thicker and the cotter hole, hole moved with it. How very clever of me. Um, but actually from experience, I know this place was a little bit too snug. So let's go in and uh, adjust that some. Now, of course, I have not labeled any of my uh, sketches, so it'd be kind of, kind of a pain. Let's see. It's not that. Is it this? Yes, it is. Okay. So I have this offset. Let's just make, let's make this zero. Uh, let's make this minus. Let's, uh, let's get rid of that constraint. Uh, so what happened here is on the existing design, the, you can kind of see it there, the cotter hole is just too, is too deep inside of the part to actually be accessible. Um, so, and actually the cotter hole probably wants to go left, right, rather than up, down. Um, although it is symmetrical, so it shouldn't really matter. Um, you could just load it. But I think what I'm gonna do as a, as a place to start is just make this tangent to that hole as opposed to sort of bisecting it there. That gives a little bit more, a little bit more of a chance of actually getting a pin through that. I think it should be a good thing. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of other usability improvements. Oh, here's a thing that I was meaning to fix for this frame. Um, I can just show you on the actual frame. So this little nubbin where the spring hooks up um, is, it doesn't print super duper cleanly. It's got a fair amount of strength for how small it is. Um, Actually, now that I cleaned it up, it's not, it's not so bad. But I was trying to think if there's a smarter way to make this little hook. Um, and that's a that's essentially the size that I need for hooking to a spring of this size. Um, and I do want it to have some, some hook at an angle properties, if you will, because the spring is pulling at a sort of oblique angle. So here's what it looks like in, uh, in the drafting. <laughs> in bright green, of course. Uh, maybe we'll, I'm gonna maybe make this a different color because this this bright green is just a little bit hard to see. Let's go back to like a basic acrylic. Uh, modify, physical material, uh, and we'll just make that uh, generic acrylic again. Yeah, it's a little bit, a little bit easier to work with there. Um, so, I mean, one option, I guess, would be to print just this little section with supports um, to handle that overhang would be fine. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, Thomas uses mostly Inland, um, which is just eSun. Yeah, this, this is what's weird about it, right? It's just like print failures happen. 
Um, and I, but I, I not, I've never seen it happen with like a decent filament. Make it a wedge instead of a nub. Ah, it's Palmer. Hello. Um, are you, you're thinking like, so I've, I've got a little bit of like a, a fillet here to fill it, but you're thinking like, maybe like make it a full wedge out this way, I think. Um, at least that's, that's what make it a wedge says to me, which I, I do like. Maybe I can do that. Where's this fillet? It's there. So I think, I think actually that should be relatively straightforward because I can do that and I can project in, oh, I, I keep covering things up with that other view. I can project this body in and take a line, say like that in the direction of tension. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you here, Palmer. Um, oh, but I've added a midpoint constraint that I didn't want. Let's make this wedgy bit, uh, let's say 10 millimeters long. Uh, uh, I guess this, this section also needs to be just like this kind of like slouchy foot section is not serving me because I want some reinforcement. I want some reinforcement going here. So I'm gonna make this wedge extend out a little bit further. Now, where did I define that? Uh, there it is. So what I would like is free that up and give myself some more room to work with here. Coincident, and this is going to be Let's say 15 millimeters now. We'll just make that foot a little bit longer. And that looks pretty good. Uh huh. And now I can turn that sketch back on. And actually, let's project in. Did I remember? Nah, I keep covering things with the camera. <laughs> uh, let's project the new position of that foot in here. And let's make this come to five millimeters from there. And now let us see if this extrude will just, ah, I need a little bit more detail here. So I need, I need a line that separates where my wedge, where my wedgy bit starts, if you will. Wedgy bit being a, a technical term. Wedgy bit starts here and goes, I want it to basically come to the plane that is through that line that is the bottom of the hook. I, I don't know that there's, I think I'm gonna have to do a little uh, plane at angle. Yep, and then we will extrude to object and join. Hmm. Now, so here's what here's what I wonder. Can I just extrude to object and, and join that and clean it up? Join. Ugh. Hmm. <laughs> choices. <laughs> choices being made. Uh, I think this is good. Good mechanically. Um, how do I make it clean? Uh, in other ways, maybe this fillet is screwing us up. Where is that? I think that's. I think that's this. Yeah, let's delete that. Save. We'll put those two as coincident. We'll put that as coincident. Finish. So now it's just more of a, we can always round off the edges at the end, right? Don't need to fill, prematurely fill it things. Um, I mean, that's already looking more mechanically sound than the other thing we had, right? Maybe we just maybe we just fill it that off and call it a day. Like maybe we just do one, two, and do that. That I kind of like because now the you know when this is all said and done, the bulk of the force is here. This is just to keep it retained on the spring. Yeah, I quite. Oh, <laughs> something else has happened here. What's what is why is all this? Uh. Uh. Whoa, why? Why big extrude? Is it really this step? Oh shit. Uh Oh no.
There we go. That's better. <laughs> Do the Phillips letter. What happened on the ends? I don't know. It was getting, it's getting very confused about a couple of my profiles. Like it doesn't like, ah, this pro, I see this. I, I killed a profile. When I got rid of those fillets, I killed a profile that it was projecting for me. So really what I should do is put a line in there and a line in here. And now just do that. There we go. That's better. <laughs> That's less awful. Missing a line. Yeah, exactly, Chris. Yeah, that. So now so this is going to be a somewhat of an overhanging part. And probably what I will just do is a support enforcer um, to print with supports just there, which is a super cool feature of um, uh, Prusa Slicer now. So if I just, for those who haven't played with it yet, um, let me uh, here. I can also do. So that would, that's the place flat on bed command, which I love, right? Let's say this is at some weird wonky angle. I can use this place but flat on bed tool, place on face. Let's say I want this face, which is recognized as a flat plane, to be flat on my print bed, and it just does it for me. Awesome. And then let's say I don't want to have uh, enforce, you know, it supports everywhere. Like I don't really want supports inside my bearing surface or inside this square. I just want them on a specific place. So there's a few ways I could do that. One of which would be to add, do a right click and hit um, add support enforcer and do a box. And then I can move and scale this box to just encompass the portion that I want um, supports in. And then I can say in my editing, let's see, where do I support? Support on support enforcers only. Yes. And then when I slice, I should get, yeah. So I just get supports where that support enforcer was and nowhere else on the model. So that's, that's quite a handy feature for something like this, which is just like a little, a little overhang that just needs a little extra love as we do this thing. This is, of course, this is the model. This is not the model we just used. This is the previous model. No, Chris, you're totally right. I just was too lazy to re-export the frame just for the sake of showing off this, this cool feature. Um, the other thing you can do in Prusa Slicer now, and I think this is new in 2.3, is paint on supports, right? So I have this paintbrush tool here. I can hit paint on supports. Um, I can choose my brush size. I can choose my angle. Um, and in this mode, uh, the left mouse button paints on supports and the right mouse button paints on support blockers. So I can say, I need this feature to be supported. I'm gonna paint supports on there. And again, when I slice, just that section has supports. So the, I, I really like the paint on supports feature for like weird shapes or space that I want to be really specific about where they get supported. Like, here's a good example. Um, let me bring in the previous shaft design. I guess you do the current shaft design. Actually, let's let's let's, let's do the current shaft design. Uh, oh no, where we're right here. We'll do the, the oh, not the Paul shaft. We will do the, uh, frame, Paul, where's my shaft? Maybe I don't have any sliced files here. We'll do the new shaft. That'll be fine. Um, so we have, we have this guy, right? Which is kind of an awkward shape to print. Although now that I don't have an internal print, you know what I should do is print it like, uh, something like that here. I'll use that flat on face feature again. Make sure we're standing up nice and straight and tall. Um, so for something like this, right, if this is if this is really the orientation I wanted to print it in, and of course it's designed to be printed, let's let's flip it around so it's how it's designed to be printed. It's designed to be printed like this, and that's why this chamfer is here, right, to give a little support to this shoulder as it's getting printed. But this is gonna be a little bit tall and unwieldy, right? I'd really like to have a little bit of support here, but I don't want to have any chance of there being supports on this barrel surface, especially when it was being my bearing surface right now, which is going to be an aesthetics thing. So what I'll do, and there's a few different ways we could do this, but what I'll do is just come in here and increase my brush size a little bit, let's say three millimeters, and I'm just going to paint a rough layer of supports all the way around the outside here, but not touching the center. And I'm going to be pretty casual about it. And then I'm going to slice this and we'll see that it's generated a set of supports. Ah, it's got a little too close. So we'll come back here and we will, oops, we will hit shift and left mouse button. That just removes whatever painting we've done. Um, and 
I will say slice now, and we can see that it's cleared our supports away. If we look up from the bottom here, it's cleared supports away from that center section, so that we're only being supported on the outside. Here, we'll take a take a cross section here. So these are just basically freestanding supports all the way up until they start to be useful to support this big top hat sitting on top. So that can be a useful feature now. Like I say, I think that is new um, in Prusa Slicer 2.3. So if you haven't downloaded it yet, it's worth getting just for that feature alone because it's super cool. Take a quick peek, Roni, on our print. We're at 54%. Ooh, it's printing quite nicely. So we should have maybe 11 minutes left on that guy. Um, let me think of the, what were the other changes that we wanted to make here. Um, so obviously, right, this is just the, the prototype for the sake of experimentation that will be a the hand winch version. Um, we'll have to do some thinking about like what the form factor of this is um, when it is a motor controlled thing. And as I'm looking at it, one of the things that stands out to me as like being particularly big and maybe a ripe field for miniaturization. Um, here, let me let me reassemble it and I think it'll I think it'll start to become clear. Um, so let's see, I get the Paul wheel goes back on there. I have this fatty gasket there. I have my handle wheel, my we need a better name than handle wheel, my force wheel, my tension wheel. My torque wheel. I like torque wheel. Uh, we have our pawl, which goes in our ratchet, and the spring goes there. And that, oh, and then we would have our, we'd have our, our end bolt for now. Um, and this should still, yeah, there we go. Um, so one of the things that's true here, right, one of the reasons that this form factor I think is not ideal is Basically, I would love to make this as small as possible, right? And um, I think something that is like roughly the form factor of this shaft um, is rather nice. Um, I'm imagining something... Take that Paul off for now. I've super glued this handle in place because I was tired of it falling out as I was uh, doing experiments with it. But if I could have the active surface of this winch, you know, obviously we'll need some kind of small frame. But if I could have the sort of active device be, you know, the size of this shaft, the stepper motor hangs off the end here, and there's maybe a little planetary gearbox in between the two, that would make me really happy. And one of the things that's that's sort of standing in the way that we need to do some thinking about is this pawl. Um, because it's it's definitely going to be something that exists outside of sort of the, the main diameter of the shaft. And I suppose, especially now that the shaft itself is smaller, maybe I make this ratchet wheel smaller. That would be a place to start, huh? Like the only reason that that shoulder and that ratchet wheel are so big is because the shaft itself was so big. Maybe we shrink those down some. That will help us condense this. Um, the other thing I'm thinking is that maybe this is not an ideal sort of... Um, Paul form factor, right? this sort of like class three lever design, which needs a big fat spring hanging off of it is maybe not ideal. This could be made um, more compact in a couple of ways, but the way that's sort of re leaping out to me is, he said reaching for a sketch pad again, is something like if uh, I'm going to do a really bad job of drawing this ratchet wheel here. Uh, so if... <laughs> that went awful. <laughs> um, here, I'll tell you, we'll do one better. Um, uh, yes, fair enough, Chris. Yeah, smaller ratchet would mean fewer, fewer locking points. Um, so we'd have sort of less angular resolution in position, which is maybe not ideal. We could also, yeah, maybe not ideal. Here, I'll just, I'm going to use this as my physical model, and I'm just going to draw what I'm imagining for a new Paul around it. Get a smaller pen. <laughs> Get this abomination off camera. Um, it could be something like a, um, like a watch escapement, right, where we have, um, an arm that comes around like so, 
and has a pivot point here, right? And is pushed in that way. Possibly, I mean, they could have another, another moment arm coming out here and a spring coming down, but I don't love that. Um, let's see. Could be... I don't think I don't think a gravity ratchet is really the way to go, given this thing wants to be in multiple orientations. Um, you know what? I'll, t I'll tell you. What, we'll do the same. The thing that I would do if it was just me sitting here, which is maybe not as exciting for y'all, but uh, let's just Google ratchet designs. Two ratchet and pauls to increase stop points. Yeah, but so we could certainly get higher angular resolution that way at the cost of size, right? Um, Let's think about it. Yeah, so here's like the classic ratchet design. Ratchet and Paul. I guess it could be a compression spring. That might save us some time. Um, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, what could we what could we do? So right now, where's my existing design? So here's here's what we've got currently. I mean, the biggest uh, the biggest obvious size of this one is just the size of this spring, um, both in terms of its length and the fact that because it's you know it's it's a small spring, but it's comparatively large in relation to the size of this object. And so to get the amount of like clearance away from the ratchet wheel that it needs. Um, you know, this arm has to be fairly long. Um, I wonder if there's some way... I'm, I'm not quite sure what I mean here. Um, it's just the start of an idea. But thinking about how to make this design more compact... I mean, one, one, I guess one thought that leaps out is, what if this mechanism, the pawl and spring, um, could be something that was attached to the inner part of the frame here as opposed to an external part? I like this for experimentation, um, but I think we could move it to like this. It could be sprung from this surface and so not have an external arm here. Uh... Ah, oh, Palmer says, maybe I'm missing a core concept, but could you switch from ratchet to gear so it's more like a chain motor? Run both directions, brake would only challenge if motor couldn't clamp. Could certainly do. One of the things that I, uh, that I, I like about this design is it's, um, the ratchet is essentially what prevents it from falling, and it, it obviates the need for me to develop a separate electrical brake, right? Where you have something like, um, you know, like a Lodestar motor. Actually, Lodestars have a very similar um, mechanism to this, but you could have like an you know um, electromagnet that disengages the brake, uh, the the load side brake, and then reapplies it at the cessation of power. Um, but this is this is basically how chain hoists work internally. So you pull one way, and it ratchets up, um, and then you you loosen and the the clamping action of the friction causes the the barrel to be able to spin and that's that tightens the friction again and prevents it from moving so in relation to like a a, a chain hoist this is actually pretty close to what that mechanism is um so yeah so and partly why i i was thinking about this design polymer is just because i think the development process on this was simpler than developing like a, another electromechanical device to be that break. It's also possible I've misunderstood your idea as well. So if I have, tell, tell me it again and I want to I want to hear about it. Um, but one of the things I'm thinking about, he said, looking over at the 88% done print that they'll test in the second is get this friction back friction wheel back off here to play with um, is something because we have all of this airspace, if you will, between the ratchet wheel and the frame. And we don't necessarily need that much, right? This shoulder is probably unnecessarily big, especially if we're going to print with additional supports. What if the... Like, this would even be made more compact if we imagine that this spring was 
instead of being attached here, was attached to a second moment arm that was attached here. Right, so we just have a little a little spring that comes off maybe from this part of the frame down to the arm, and that's what's providing this tension. And then the spring actually doesn't need to be in the same plane as the ratchet wheel at all. Right, it could be offset on a shaft that was off to the side there. And then this whole mechanism gets gets shrunk in somehow. Um, the thought I was having earlier, and it's it's for sure a, a partially formed thought, but what if, you know what I can do is probably just trace this. Not very well. <laughs> but it's better than, it's better than the freehand. Um, I wonder if there's any hay to be made, he said, grabbing another color of Sharpie that's not yellow, because that's gonna be a disaster. Do like a little, oh, that's, oh, that's blue, that'll be fine. Um, something that's like, somehow like a squeeze ratchet, like it's got a tooth there and a tooth there and a spring that runs behind the gearing between them. Like I say, it's a, it's a very half formed thought, but it's looking at like the amount of sort of wasted space we have in here, like something that sits, you know, essentially around I don't know if it's literally behind, maybe it's in front of, maybe it's, you know, sort of arcs around, but it's the sort of squeezing action of a spring um, that causes it to... And it, of course, it will still need to be attached to the frame in some way, right? Because the ratchet has to be rigid to the frame. It ratchets... I could say it has to ratchet in relation to the frame. That's, that's the whole point of the, of the thing. Um... But somehow, like, the idea of, like, it's a spring that, that is not acting so much uh, on the frame and an arm, but on two arms of, a, of, a, of the ratchet itself. And then, is there a way that we could design it quite cleverly so that, like, and now I really am just making things up, but, but to your point, Chris, about, like, angular resolution, what if it, like... And it'd be hard to zoom in enough to see this, but what if the arms were not such that, like, so if the arms were perfectly symmetrical across the shaft, they would be, like, in this slot and this tooth, right? They'd be opposite sides. What if one of the teeth was slightly offset so that when the the first pawl clears, the ratchet only rotates a quarter, a, a half a tooth's rotation, and this paw stalls here, and then when this imaginary pawl gets cleared, this ratchets into place... I guess it, this, I guess the other thing is in this design, it never does, it never does run backward. Really what I would say is like this clicks into place and then it rotates another half tooth and this paw clicks into place. And then that paw, so my, my fingernail here being the other paw, like click, 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 click. And we, we get double the angular resolution with a single spring. Maybe? I'm kind of, I, I am kind of, I'm 100% making up that that's a thing that could actually work. But I'm intrigued by that as a possibility. Because um, I do think that, I mean, scaling, something smaller in scale than this would be nice as a an ultimate form factor. This is not bad. Um, certainly if it were motor up, it would not be too bad. Um... You know, if this thing is mounted up here doing some lifting like that, I think is okay. If it's going to be mounted motor down, I think it looks like, well, maybe I think it looks a little silly on top of truss, but it's not awful. But if it could be more compact, it would be better. Ah, we're done. Excellent. Uh, let us do that. And we shall pull our prints off of the bed. and see how we did. All right, let's get let's get the uh, the embarrassing sketches out of here. So there is our shaft and the top part of our frame in theory. Let's see. So we deliberately made the fit quite tight. So hopefully this should probably be a little snug. Ooh, it's quite snug. Ooh, but it's snug in a good way. Ooh, I feel all Ivan Miranda y up in here. Another another great channel to watch. If you do not watch Ivan Miranda and his incredible 3D printed things, worth worth seeking out. 3D printed tank treads, all kinds of cool stuff. Let's see how the shaft fits. Ah, shaft is too loose. 
Jeff is, is certainly too loose in there. But that this is a tight fit. I feel I, I don't think we need anything more to retain the uh, the bearing inside the frame. That's gonna we're gonna keep that dimension. But while I'm thinking of it, let's go back in and we'll adjust the shaft dimensions. Um, make it a little bit tighter now. Let's see. Let us inspect. Oh, that's that's the threaded end. I want the non-threaded end. Inspect. That circle is exactly eight millimeters. Ah, so I guess I didn't trust my calipers because I measured this at like 8.1 or something. Um, and I was like, oh, it's probably exactly eight. But no, it turns out that's a little bit too loose. So let's come back to our very first sketch here. And I guess let's oversize this a little bit as well. Let's let's retake that measurement. Um, just that I'm you know, now going to trust things. It's 8.11. One, three. I'm going to make this 8.2 on the shaft, and if that's a little bit too big, I think I'd rather it be a little bit too big than too small. I mean, it's not, a, it's not, it, it, it fits well enough in there that, like, we can rotate. I don't know if you can see that bearing rotating there. Um, but it's certainly not snug enough to serve. I, well, you know, honestly, I suppose this shaft doesn't have to be perfect, a perfect fit inside the bearing, right? Because the bearing is just there to provide additional rotational smoothness, but it'd be nice if it fit better. Let's make that just a solid 8.1, uh, 8.2. Let's just make it 8.2. We'll finish that and we'll look, we'll go back to the full model and make sure we didn't break anything in the meantime. It doesn't look like it. So that's quite good. And we'll try out that retaining clip on there as well. Um, yeah, well, so, okay. So a, a, a win and a partial win. Like that's, that's quite a good fitment. Um, I'm actually, I might be a little bit hard pressed to get that out of there. Um, the other thing I guess that we should test before we wrap up, if we can, is um, I'd be a little bit hard without proper rotation in there. Uh, maybe not. Uh, we can use some of our favorite uh, blue tack if I can remember where I stuck it. Um, so like the, the problem we are trying to solve with this redesign, right, is that in the original winch design with enough side loading on this, on this barrel, the shaft just wouldn't spin. I mean, you might be able to tell like how, how jerky it is, even in just like rotating it with no load, um, with a pound of load with my, my pound of solder test weight. Um, it, it, <laughs> it didn't move at all. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is just test the test this under a bit of load. And it's not going to be able to be full load because we don't have the full setup and the full shaft and everything. But um, I'm just casting around for, as, you know, as usual, I've misplaced my my sticky tack. That's going to be, oh, no, it's in my adhesive. I had misplaced my entire adhesives bin and now I found it. <laughs> Let's see if we can, what I'm going to do is just loosely put this shaft in here just to get a sense of when this thing is is properly in place, how will it deal with with loading? Yeah, we'll just sort of cram that guy in there. As if this was a, a nice tight fit. That actually worked out pretty well as a fitting device. Um, and I can already tell, I mean, it's, it's so much smoother than, um, than, uh, <laughs> than PLA on PLA as a, an axle bearing. Um, like I, 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 hard to get this to come across, but I'm gonna, I can push down quite hard on that shaft and the rotation is still not a problem. And that makes sense, right? These are, I think, nominally skateboard bearings, right? That, that's at least the name they are often sold under is a skateboard bearing. So they're meant to allow an axle to spin while, uh, you know, a, a human is standing on top of them or on top of four of them, I guess, in the case of a skateboard. Um, so the fact that they, they hand up, handle side loading and rotation well is sort of the whole point of the thing. And also, this looks quite nice. I love this is this is not that blue e sun. This is I think inland, which maybe as I learned tonight, maybe is the same thing. Um, but I also I think it just looks that that bearing in there just looks quite nice. And now let's see, I can pull the shaft out. Yeah, this is a really really snug fit. I think that's going to be great. Uh, yeah, so we'll move forward with that. So I think next steps are um, obviously print out new frame, new shaft, and retest. Um, and if that works, then I think that the the hand winch will be in good shape and we'll start thinking about 
um, additional pull mechanisms to sort of condense the form factor down. Think about mating to a um, a stepper motor, right? And do we need gear reduction? Do we need a... I think the idea... I, I have never designed a planetary gearbox. Um, and I don't know that one is necessary here, but it might be kind of a fun challenge and a nice compact way of doing some some gear ratio adjustment here. Might be kind of fun. Um, and then, of course, thinking about like electronics and power for these things. Um, and... You know, if we're gonna if we're gonna do a stepper motor, we'll need a stepper motor driver. And is there a cleaner way of having that nearby? Um, I also wonder, you know, for something like depending on the use case, right? Like this could depending on what we're imagining this stage setup is. Oh Jesus! I, I was seeing my own finger in camera here off to the side of the screen, and I was like, is there someone? Is there someone behind me? Um, if we're imagining these as like winches on truss, right? We'd probably have like, I don't know, probably two of them for a short truss like this. Um, and then we get into issues of synchro synchronization, right? So we do we have one stepper motor driver driving two steppers, so they're perfectly in sync? Or do we think about this like a line set system and mount, you know, a single stepper, a single winch maybe on the floor or something, or maybe it's maybe it's overhead mounted, running through some shivs and head blocks up here and acting kind of like a, like a line set system. Um, and that, that's, that is, I think, a slightly less pretty solution, but it also solves the issue of synchronizing servos. Thomas, I don't know if this is something you've run into in your projects is like, you know, if, if we're going to have two winches driving one truss, um, especially if they're just little little stepper motors, it'd be really nice for them to be very nicely in sync. And I'm sure, you know, synced in code would be synced enough for our purposes at this scale. But I'm wondering if it's necessary to run both steppers either off maybe off of the same driver is too much but maybe they run off of like identical control system uh, identical control signals to a couple of step sticks or something like that so more 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 things to think on i think of um for the future but good progress tonight good progress this week i i don't know where like uh, as you know energy is all over the place these days in, in this weird weird world but i'm really happy with having iterated this design over the week since we last talked and i'm really happy with that fit and that solution to our friction problem so yeah that's what we're gonna call it for tonight so i think it, the thing worked the other thing 90 percent worked so on average you're batting an a because you bat a's Anyway, have a wonderful week, y'all. Uh, wash your hands, stay safe, hydrate, have a lovely drink for yourself with me if that's your thing. Um, I hope to be back with you next Sunday. There is a tiny chance that I will not. Um, we have some uh, errand, an important errand to run during the day that I think will bring me back in time. Um, if it doesn't, then it doesn't. Um, but hopefully I will see you back here at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time next Sunday night where we'll hopefully work on more winchy things. We'll see what problems I've been able to solve during the week and what problems that leaves for us uh, to solve next Sunday. But uh, until then, thanks as always, everybody. Good to see you. Good to see some familiar faces. Uh, Palmer, Thomas, Chris, Dave, everybody. Broke both. Lovely to see you. Cookie. Cookie, I think I, I, I said to folks uh, last week, I know you've been working on winches as well. I don't mean to steal your thunder. I just got real excited because, because boy, it's cute. Um, so yeah, we'll have a good old time. And then we, I want to see your designs too, as it comes forward. Um, speaking of, if anyone has things they want to send, if you have photos of your work, if you have questions, if you just want to say hi, easiest way to do it is on Twitter at Jeffers Glass, like, subscribe, bell, uh, send me a million dollars. That's just for you millionaires. I got nothing finding my good night button so I can so I can cut myself off there it is good night y'all I'll see you next week